introduce you to Robert Jesse, Bob Jesse, who I've known for many years. And, um, you know, it's hard to, this is a 10th year anniversary conference. We've brought back so many wonderful people. It's hard to, you know, say one of my favorites because everyone here has really been a, a hero of mine. And uh, Bob Jesse is, is no exception. He's the founder of the uh, Council on Spiritual Practices. It's been over a decade. The novel at the time proposition that psychedelic use did not have to be in a medical context, but that these are sacraments, spiritual practices, and didn't need to be regulated or uh, controlled by a physician. And he's been working tirelessly through CSP and also behind the scenes, one of the prime movers behind the um, startup of the Johns Hopkins Research uh, Program, which is so, so, so big and so influential. Um, and w just one small anecdote about Bob, that um, I, I, when I first met him, he was, telling, he was talking about how he could help um, groups, uh, religious uh, study groups, survive Supreme Court scrutiny. And the method was to take all of the Supreme Court religious freedom, uh, drug religious freedom uh, cases, and sort of reverse engineer them. Well, Timothy Leary, for example, created, after he got busted, the League for Spiritual Discovery, LSD. And he went before the Supreme Court to defend his right to, to take drugs. And they said, well, don't be ridiculous, Mr. Leary. You just founded this church six months ago. So the lesson is, have a long-standing tradition. And the Rastafarians, all you do is smoke dope. And so, all right, have a liturgy, have something more than just the, the sacrament. And onward through the different religious freedom cases, the peyote cases and all, and created therefore what you need, a long-standing church that has more than just the sacrament and all the other lessons incorporated. And I was reminded of that today, the reason I'm mentioning it is because of the, um, the way the UDV has uh, withstood, withstood scrutiny, because, not because by accident, but they'd been grooming for that for years. Um, so, Bob Jesse. Robert Jesse is the convener of the Council on Spiritual Practices, CSP. Through CSP, he was instrumental in forming the psilocybin research team at Johns Hopkins. He's co-author of its first paper in 2006, Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experiences, Having si Substantial and Sustained Personal Meaning and Spiritual Significance. And I've referred to that paper a couple of times. That was a, a, a pivotal moment when that paper came out. Um, and he is one of the team's co-investigators. Bob now serves on the board of USONA Institute and is an advisor to the California Institute of Integral Studies. In 2005, he led the writing of an amicus brief for the US Supreme Court in a key religious liberty case that was decided eight to zero in favor of the US branch of the Brazilian church, the Unia de Vegetal. Prior to CSP, Bob worked as a consultant in information technology for AT&T Bell Labs and others, then in several capacities for Oracle Corporation, how appropriately named. Lastly, as a vice president of business development, his university training is in computer science and electrical engineering, along with Myron Stolaroff. Please uh, help me welcome Bob Jesse. Bob. <laughs> Brother. Hey, everybody. Uh, Kevin and Neil, wherever you are, just want to acknowledge your decade of vision and hard work. Also to your board of directors and your many able helpers. Um, and your success for a decade in bringing together people for sharing knowledge, for deepening perspectives. Uh, and the results are really showing off at this conference and others. Just looking out on the room, hearing the questions, this is a highly educated group of people. And the, the level of knowledge and the breadth of perspective around psychedelics in this room uh, is going to be needed, which is to say all of us are going to be needed, to carry this forward into the population at large, not necessarily to recruit them, but just to help them understand what it is that we're doing and what we care about. I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging some of my elders. Uh, this is just to say their names out loud. Also to acknowledge that really very little of what you're going to hear from me comes from me. A lot of it comes from a, a lineage and a circle of peers and elders. Uh, and I imagine that's true for all of us. So let me just name a few of mine. These are people who were, were or are living, but I had contact with them, sometimes substantial contact. Houston Smith, Willis Harmon, Brother David Stendhal Rast, and Ann Shulgin. There are people that I count as exemplars or teachers, even though our paths did not cross in their lifetimes, to name just three, Aldous Huxley, Walter Houston Clark, and Lisa Bieberman. 
I'm sure that each of you has at least one, probably several people who in the psychedelic realm or philosophical or religious realm um, you have looked up to and learned from. Can we take just a minute for you to look inside and silently say their names or acknowledge their gifts to you? All right, thank you. So I've heard most of the talks this weekend, and once again, I'm just um, astonished at the amount of progress that has been made, apparently against long odds, in various aspects of this field we call the psychedelic field. I respect it, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, therefore, I ask your indulgence as I say some things that may be more provocative than congratulatory. And I do it not to end conversation, but in the hopes of stimulating conversation. I'm going to flag some issues that I think may become real issues that could either seriously derail progress or push progress to the side a little bit. Uh, and I'm doing it mainly to engage all of us in problem solving, not just today, but ongoingly. So, um, there is a word that we hear a lot these days, which is renaissance. People talk about a psychedelic renaissance. And I understand why that's said. The word renaissance really means rebirth, and it's clear that's happening. But um, I'm preferring for the moment to use the term re-emergence instead of renaissance. I'd like to reserve the word renaissance for a place that we haven't reached yet. And let me describe some of those uh, goals that aren't here yet, they may be a couple years off, they may be many years off. One is when the public at large more accurately understands the psychedelics and their properties. Another is when psychedelic assisted therapies become widely available. Big bonus points of psychedelic assisted therapies become widely available to people without regard to their ability to pay. As Roland set out very, clear, uh, very clearly yesterday, at least for the therapies that use psilocybin as an adjunct. It really is the mystical type experience, the mystiform experience, the unitive experience, that seems to be the critical predictor of good therapeutic outcomes. And that's not just restricted to therapy. If you look at healthy normals who report this experience, afterwards they'll say it was one of the most important, spiritually significant, personally meaningful of their lives. In my view, that experience is a birthright doesn't mean everyone wants it. It's neither necessary nor sufficient for a life well lived. But I'll happily say that we've achieved a psychedelic renaissance when that experience is available under good circumstances to anyone who wants it. A corollary to that, the experience alone is not enough. Houston Smith and many others have said that it's not altered states that counts, but rather altered traits. And altered traits for virtually all of us, I think, take a long time to develop. Uh, Bia said a little while ago, we got to do our homework. So when there are sort of suitable contexts to help us do our homework, that will be another marker for me that we've actually achieved a renaissance. So uh, to get to those goals, the paths are uncertain. And there are some things that could go wrong, either seriously or just taking us off the path a little bit. Um, we talk about the field. I never know whether to call it a field or rather many fields that for the time being are compressed together in the same auditorium. Why? Because we talk about a wide variety of substances, which includes disagreement about what is and what is not a psychedelic. How about ketamine? How about cannabis? How about nitrous oxide? And so on. They're used for a wide variety of purposes in a wide variety of contexts, and they're subject to a wide variety of changing laws and customs and skills. Uh, to illustrate the point, we've got microdosing, use of psychedelics for emotional access during conventional talk therapy, or to treat PTSD, or for philosophical exploration, or to enhance aesthetic appreciation or nature awareness, to enhance creativity, and usually in high doses, and I put this one last on purpose, for non-dual awareness. So starting right away with this diversity, things could go wrong. What could go wrong? That's a really big picture to try to explain to somebody who does not have the experience of the people in this room. If all those claims are made in the same breath, it starts to sound like we're talking about a panacea, a cure-all, maybe we want to put it in the drinking water, which, you know, is not the case. But if you're not educated, it sounds like, boy, there's not a problem this couldn't solve. So we generate 
potential resistance for ourselves if we allow our claims to be too broad, at least for now. Um, other domains in which things could go wrong. Uh, I'll start with laboratory research because I think it's actually one of the safest. And by this I mean to include both laboratory research, prospective research with healthy volunteers and therapeutic uses. The big thing that could go wrong is what is called um, in that field a serious adverse event. It could be a medical issue, and medical issues, by the way, can happen to anyone at any time, not on a psychedelic. So just statistically, there may be one at some point during a laboratory, psilocybin or MDMA or whatever session. There are also possible psychological or psychiatric um, negative effects that could happen that would get enough attention to slow things down. However, this avenue seems to be the most likely to be fruitful and the least likely to be problematic. It's also easy to talk about with um, you know, your, your next door neighbor, uh, your professors, uh, the people you work with. Why? Because it gives the accurate appearance of being well contained. The sessions are safeguarded. They're conducted by trained people. The protocols are approved by institutional review boards and government regulators. The whole thing is contained so that it doesn't look like the drugs and the drug experiences are going to spill out into the streets. In other words, it's made safe to talk about and therefore easy to take in. The next domain where possibly things could go wrong or go sideways, I'm going to put under the label of religious use, which is a very wide umbrella. Uh, to illustrate some of the religious uses, uh, as was described a moment ago and earlier by Bia, there are religious uses of entheogens, I'll use that word, that look a lot like established religions. Uh, there's a lineage, there's training to be a leader within the tradition, there's a congregation, there's established forms of worship. So that's one category of entheogen use under the religion umbrella. There's also the shamanic model and variations on that. Sometimes only the shaman takes the medicine, sometimes the shaman and the person being healed, sometimes only the person being healed, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in groups. However, not usually congregationally. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I believe it's accurate to apply the word religion to less formal forms of use. Uh, friend groups, for example, who are not operating with a received tradition particularly, uh, but are very often gathering a very serious purpose, intent, skill, and um, have very powerful life-changing experiences with each other, just as friend circles. There are what um, anthropologists call new religious movements, and there's this whole other area called retreat centers. So what could really go wrong? What really could go wrong comes from incompetence and exploitation. Either people who are not qualified to run sessions and so eventually that there, uh, there's a medical emergency or there's some psychiatric issue that persists, people can be you know, seriously harmed. Rarely, but it can happen. And if there's enough press around it, enough attention, it might generate a backlash. There's entheotourism. Um, a lot of it is wonderful, offered by wonderful, skilled people who are uh, offering very helpful services to people. But when one looks at the whole thing, it looks kind of messy down there. It's a jungle out there. And uh, it makes me hesitant to call that a renaissance. It might be a renaissance in formation. So much of what I'm going to call immature religion, in contrast to mature religion, comes from unwholesome or confused motives, particularly around money, sex, um, holding what you might call the chalice of transformation or other forms of power. Um, let's have a look at one such case. And I'm going to show this publicly because it made itself very public. Uh, this is a screen capture from December of last year. Um, a group that has alternately called itself um, Ayahuasca USA or Ayahuasca Healings USA, um, offering the first ever legal ayahuasca retreat in the United States proclaiming a hundred and some acres in Washington state, gonna gear up business any day now. Uh, the leader in the upper right hand of the screen uh, says, welcome, I am Trinity. Who I really am is infinite, nameless, and beyond all labels and words. <laughs> if you scroll down the lengthy, lengthy webpage, you'll get to a place that says, 
We are here to build 30 Ayahuasca USA retreat centers and churches in the 30 largest cities in America before 2032, our new golden age. If you scroll down further, you'll find paragraph upon paragraph about while participation is by donation only, I'm paraphrasing here, if you don't donate a lot, it probably means you're not doing enough spiritual work. So, um, there is a certain amount of self-regulation within this community and as Bia said, within the ayahuasca community. And a number of people with authority to speak did speak and within a certain amount of time, this webpage was taken down. One thing that's come to my attention, I have um, someplace, uh, some documents that I believe to be authentic, where this group is now regrouping, approaching the Drug Enforcement Administration in the US and asking for permission to build a retreat center with the DEA's blessing. The attorney who filed this paperwork uh, said, oh, my clients were a little enthusiastic and they don't really want to open 30 retreat centers and here's pages of our lineage and whatnot and I don't know what DEA is going to say. I don't know if they've ruled on it yet. This group claimed that their uh, authority came from a spin-off of the Native American church called ONAC. I met somebody a year and some ago who carried in her wallet a laminated ONAC membership card. Um, and I can't read the text here, but it basically says, the, the, this is the backside, uh, the bearer of this card uh, possesses the Native American church uh, privileges to have sacraments, including but not limited to peyote, ayahuasca, cannabis, uh, psilocybe mushrooms, fungi, etc. Uh, and, and guess what? You can buy that card. It's obtainable for dollars. So what happens if substance-based religion becomes too hot for the culture at large to handle? Too much of this happens. Well, the culture at large has recourse. The DEA can tighten up and say no, and the courts can tighten up and say no. And furthermore, the protection under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is not by constitutional law, it's by statutory law. So Congress can revise RFRA. They could revise RFRA to exclude from its purview the Controlled Substances Act. I hope that doesn't happen. So those are the big things that could go wrong. Uh, what about more subtle things that could go wrong? I'm going to ask you to bear with me here. There's an issue that is variously called trivialization or the profaning of a sacrament. Um, I'm going to read to you some words written by Houston Smith a couple of decades ago. And just by way of preamble, uh, I've known Houston many years. I consider him to be extraordinarily wise. He has a multi-millennia view of religion and its place in culture, humanity. Uh, there's not a mean bone in his body, and he's not an authoritarian. Nonetheless, he wrote, <laughs> to argue that there are things in religion that are best kept secret cuts against our democratic grain. Yet, tested religions do so argue. There are pearls which, cast before swine, will be damaged themselves by trampling, or will damage the swine should the swine eat them. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna forbids imparting higher knowledge to those who are not ready for it. Either, as I have said, the subject will be damaged, or the significance of the experience will be missed and the encounter trivialized. Thus, either the subject is damaged or the dharma is damaged, usually both. The psychedelic movement pays lip service to these dangers by advising screening and preparing subjects. But on the whole, it honors the esoteric, exoteric distinction only perfunctorily. That was 1967. Things have changed a little bit. I'm not sure they've changed a lot. There's been some talk this weekend about the big five personality trait of openness. Catherine McLean at Hopkins was able to mine the Hopkins data and demonstrate that yes, it is actually possible to move the needle on a personality construct thought to be basically stable throughout life, changing a little bit, but not rapidly. So everyone thinks that's a great thing, right? Who wouldn't want to be more open to new ideas and have more creativity and whatnot? Well, it turns out that there are six subscales to openness. Two of them are the tendency to be intellectually curious and open to new ideas. Another is the tendency towards a vivid imagination and fantasy life. So I asked the question, where's the line between openness and gullibility? Let's talk about the New Age movement. <laughs> Somebody asked Houston Smith, what's the difference between your spiritual practice and the New Age practice of taking a bit from shamanism, a bit from Buddhism, a bit from the goddess, etc.? Houston replies, 
What you describe as New Age, and what I call the cafeteria approach to spirituality, is not the way organisms are put together, nor great works of art. And the vital tradition is more like an organism or a work of art than it is like a cafeteria tray. The New Age movement looks like a mixed bag. I see much in it that seems good. It's optimistic, it's enthusiastic, it has the capacity for belief. On the debit side, I think one needs to distinguish between belief and credulity. How deep does the New Age go? Has it come to terms with radical evil? More, I'm not sure how much social conscience there is in the New Age thinking. If we think, for example, that we're drawing closer to transcendence or God, but are not drawing closer in compassion and concern for our fellow human beings, we're just fooling ourselves. Do New Age groups produce a Mother Teresa or a Dalai Lama? Not that I can see. So at its worst, it can be a kind of private escapism to titillate oneself. So that again was a couple decades ago. Um, here's an announcement I picked up on the internet um, when earlier this year, March this year. Uh, it has a number of typos, some of which don't change the pronunciation. One does, and I will pronounce it as written. Hello, friends, greater than three, heart symbol. <laughs> I invite you to come out to this very special spiritual activation event. There will be very great sound healing as well. Didgeridoo Master John will be doing didgeridoo healing as well as polyphonic pineal overtone throat singing. These vibrations bring us into a higher frequency of consciousness as galactic star sister Jane transmits downloads to connect us to the solar disks, upgrading our DNA. I highly suggest you try to make it out. This will be a very powerful healing ceremony. It will be a trip, exclamation mark. You know, I've experienced sound healing. It's really powerful. And this person may be very well-intentioned and may be providing a great evening for people. But I don't know how to place it in the context of what Houston Smith is warning us about. Uh, a bit about integration. Everyone's talking about it. I agree with Bia entirely. It's really about doing our homework. And in some ways, the less said, the better. Uh, know them by their fruits more than their words. Let's distinguish two kinds of integration. If somebody has an actual therapeutic need for healing, a healing session might be offered, maybe more than one of them, and after that, there may be some time-delimited integration work to complete the healing. The sharpest example would be the use of psilocybin and cognitive behavioral therapy to end addiction to cigarettes. You got a start date. A month later, you're abstinent or not. Six months later, you're abstinent or not. There will be a time when, you know, it looks like you've solidified that and your integration for that purpose is done. Integration is different when we talk about psychedelics used for the betterment of well people. I think I am not speaking only for myself when I say that my own experience of integration is far from complete and will probably last a lifetime. If your cosmology goes there, mine doesn't necessarily. It may take multiple lifetimes. Brother David Stendelrast had something to say about this. Um, he uses the term, which I endorse strongly, primary religious experience, for reasons which you could ask me about later, as a near synonym for mystical experience, non-dual experience, and so on. Brother David says, a primary religious experience is no more, though also no less, than a seed for a spiritual life. A genuine encounter with the ultimate does not guarantee a genuine spirituality. The experience may be authentic, but how authentic their spirituality will be depends on what those who have had the experience will do with it. Will they allow it to transform their lives? Will they have determination and patience enough to let the light which they glimpsed for a moment gradually penetrate every smallest detail of their days? In my view so far, for virtually all of us, that's a lifelong process, and it virtually requires some form of supportive social vessel. We can't do it alone. It's not easy, and it's also not quick or easy to develop long-term, stable, multi-generational communities that can hold that process for a lifetime. It's an extra challenge in being a part of such a group or helping to form such a group to form it in a way, in other words, to form its DNA, 
you might say, to make it resistant to the organizational pathologies that so often plague spiritual groups. But I'm convinced it can be done. Uh, we can look at the Quakers, and we can look at Alcoholics Anonymous for templates, really, for building communities that have withstood the test of time and where corruption is pretty much unheard of. Um, another area where things could go wrong, uh, commercialization. Uh, back, please. Uh, before we go there, um, have a look at this. Here we have somebody swallowing a capsule. I would find the image more compelling if the person were swallowing a mushroom, uh, surrounded by weapons, law enforcement, put before a judge and put in prison. This is probably emotionally evocative for you. It is for me. Uh, briefly, I would just like to, to advance the notion that the psychedelic community, many of us, are actually wounded by perpetual fear of this kind of eventuality. It actually happens very rarely for psychedelic users. I know the number is not zero. Uh, I've talked to people for whom it is, the, it is the case that mere users can be arrested. But who here has not had a moment of thinking, is my phone tapped? When's there going to be a no-knock search at the door? That's actually a wounding thing. And I can speak out of personal experience. Many decades ago when I felt this wounding, I thought, well, the solution is legalize all drugs. Let's get the drug laws off my back. And uh, I now have a more nuanced view of that. If I find this picture abhorrent as applied to psychedelic users, there's another picture that I find differently abhorrent. If you look at the person in the center at the bottom, this is a hapless seeker who's traveling through a bazaar with all kinds of people offering enticements. Here, come take this retreat. Here, use this special sacrament, which, by the way, I'm not going to tell you what's in it. Um, there's something about the, the commercialization, potential exploitation, that again, I, I just find differently abhorrent. Uh, I really wanted to go into a medical marijuana dispensary or in a state where it's legal, an actual marijuana store, and take pictures of the way cannabis is marketed, but it didn't seem right to do that. It seemed a little exploitative on my own part. So instead, uh, turning the clock back, call it a century, uh, I found another example of what we can watch out for. We've all heard of patent medicines, otherwise known as nostrums. Um, here we have uh, Pinkham's herb medicine. What's in it? Who knows? Here's what ails you. Or brain salt. Who wouldn't want some oil of gladness? <laughs> or some Indian root pills. Or nerve and brain tablets. Or stuff in a language I can't read. Or Peruvian syrup or, and this is my favorite, Beecham's Pills, Circumstances Alter Cases. So, some of this, I'm sure, is already happening. And if we look to a full legalization, commercialization of even psychedelics, not to mention drugs, absolute guarantee this is going to happen. Um, I know that there's all kinds of nuances in different types of, I'll use the word entheogens, uh, just as a wine connoisseur would notice there's a lot of difference between this red and that red or this red and that white or this sparkling and that still. But from a standpoint of occasioning the mystical type experience, there's really a lot that'll do it for you. And I'm not sure that we need a lot of branded secret ingredient um, offerings to cloud the field. Let's see, there are other uses. We've talked about uh, laboratory research, religious use, and other uses. Um, other uses would include underground therapy, about which I won't say anything due to time. The overlapping categories of personal growth, aesthetic enhancement, creativity, uh, and recreation. By the way, only in the context of drug use is recreational considered to be a bad word. Our tax dollars go to departments of parks and recreation. I'd, I'd kind of like to reclaim that word, recreation, right? It's a little like being born again. Doesn't, it, when you take a nice walk in the woods, don't you feel recreated in a way? That's a, that's a good thing. So what could go wrong with these other uses? I'm going to start with a trivial one, but I really kind of mean it. Go onto YouTube and look for videos of people, typically young people, taking salvia divinorum. You know, but it's just not pretty. <laughs> Categorical errors in the media. 
Uh, there was a case uh, not many months ago, it's really so horrific, I kind of don't want to say it out loud, but it was an act of violence and murder where somebody under the influence of something, let's just say defaced somebody. Again, it's too horrible to mention out loud. Uh, some of the press reported that as the person being under the influence of a hallucinogen. Probably wasn't. But it only takes a small number of misstatements like that to set us way back. So I hope there's not too much of it, and I hope that we respond quickly when it happens. Uh, I do think, and Stan Groff has said this, that there is still room for a culture war backlash. And the surest thing to provoke it, in my view, is to associate psychedelics as agents of progressive social change. We're going to change how the world thinks. We're going to change how the world votes. We're going to change you. And, you know, a lot of people won't like that. Contrast it with meditation retreat centers that actually do meditation, you know, Vipassana and whatnot. They don't advertise themselves as agents of social revolution. They just say, hey, we teach meditation. You should come check it out. And that seems to me a good stance for us to take regarding psychedelics. Um, likewise, premature social... Of Thank you. Um, likewise, premature political activism around psychedelics. You know, the clinical track, the laboratory research track is so strong and seems so likely to succeed, and there's so much support behind it. I wouldn't want to see any of us generate flack that would slow it down, particularly as the FDA process gets to the highest level of approval where there are public hearings. So I realize that that means not all of our agendas are going to advance at the same time, um, but the Laboratory research clinical track seems to me to be the, the very most promising. Um, one last item about what could go wrong. Um, and I could probably use help with it myself. Maybe we all could. It has to do with inflation and grandiosity. I'm going to call those occupational hazards uh, for pretty much everyone in the room. I mean, who hasn't had a thought about, you know, the world really needs what we have to offer and we want it to happen as soon as possible and we can do it, and our substances can do it. Um, I can think of one preventive and one corrective for that. The preventive is the AA tradition of attraction instead of promotion. Just don't say very much. You know, if there's a good thing, people will find it, and they'll be supported by people who found it before them. A corrective is the receiving and the giving of feedback amongst all of us, even when it's uncomfortable to do so. And uh, I'd like to do for you what I've done with other audiences and just uh, make it very personal. And say that um, I would welcome your feedback. If I say things that seem to you to be off track or harmful or incorrect, please come up and tell me that or email me and tell me that. And I will do my best to receive your feedback gracefully with an open mind to have a conversation if needed and to thank you for it, even when it's uncomfortable for me to hear. You know, attaboys are welcome too, but really it's the constructive criticism, the constructive feedback that will help me most. And I'm saying that for two reasons. One is I actually want that. But the other is I'm hoping that you will consider making the same request to your friends and your communities. It's, um, it's, how, we, um, it's how we have each other's backs. Uh, oh, boys. Here's... Going back to the patent medicines, here's a way to do it right. Sandoz did this early on. This is a Sandoz marked bottle of uh, psilocybin, which they trademarked indocybin, two milligram pills, no particular claims, you know exactly what's in it, you know the strength. If stuff has to be marketed that comes out of a lab, hope it looks like this. But um, you know, I have a lot of respect, a lot of reverence for this, and for San Pedro, and for ayahuasca, and for the grasses that yield DMT. Um, insofar as in a future environment where the growing, the collecting, the using of these materials uh, is not punished, prosecuted, this seems to me to be a really great way to go. So the context for everything that I've said, uh, I'd like to put under the rubric of the long arc. And by that I mean unfolding over generations. 
Uh, it's very tempting to want to jump the gun, what I would call jump the gun, and say, let's do this thing tomorrow, let's rush this thing through. And all the things that have been talked about this weekend, or even that I've talked about in the past half hour, some of these are very, very long-term projects, and best not rushed. There are some things that can be done quickly, following up on some of the very promising uh, clinical research, for example, smoking cessation. However, the larger task of generating longitudinally stable multi-generational communities in which to play out lifelong integration of letting the light penetrate the smallest detail of our lives, that's, um, that's long and hard work. So, um, I thank you for being on board for it. And uh, I look forward to a time when we can all proclaim a real renaissance. Dr. Jesse. Council on Spiritual Practices. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your foundational uh, kick-starting the whole thing and your work with uh, Council on Spiritual Practices and the Hopkins work. I'd, I'd like to hear a little more as you talk about um, you know, the long arc and the, the cautionary tone around just reconciling between the progressive social change, you presented that as something not to link psychedelic with, with the findings from the Hopkins studies that talks about the growth in uh, characteristics such as altruism, compassion, pro-social attitude, and how that links very clearly in my mind to a lot of the social problems that we're seeing in our society, uh, particularly Evelyn, in, uh, in this election cycle, that it would be very easy to say, hey, look what's happening in the Black Lives Matter movement and how we're breaking down and seeing the other here are these tools that could uh, increase compassion and self-awareness in our society. What about making those links explicitly as this uh, psychedelics as a kind of a vector, an agent of change towards greater harmony? Thank you. I didn't hear all of your words, but I think I got most of it. Um, do I understand correctly that you take it as an article of faith that if these materials used appropriately can increase altruism, compassion, and so on, that that leads to social change? So you take that as an article of faith? Yeah, that, the, the findings from the Hopkins study. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, will people in the room please raise your hand if you take that as an article of faith? Uh, it just means you think it's going to happen. You think that, that uh, building pro-social traits within leads to behavior change that's socially good. Okay, a lot of hands go up. We don't need to say anything more than that. You can whisper it to your friends. You can offer feedback to each other. If we think that change starts within, let it start within and let it ripple out. Another question. A question on the other side. I wanted to ask you a bit about a portion of your talk because I was lost a little bit on the context um, and seeing as there is a degree of acceptance in terms of you saying anything controversial, I hope that I will have that same <laughs> acceptance if this is controversial, but the section that you were talking about um, was about New Age, and, and I wasn't exactly sure why that came up. There was definitely chuckles and such, um, but I thought kind of like, well, why specifically pick on these people and call it a private escape to titillate oneself? Um, I'm sorry, call it a what? Uh, I would say something, a private escape to, at worst, it's a private escape to titillate oneself or something like that. And yes, I, I see that it cherry picks from, you know, Buddhism and the goddesses and etc. But at the same time, um, that sort of thing I, I see occurs in times in, in Christianity and Judaism as well, pious and church of the shul and then rude and judgmental outside of it. And they also, those are faiths are also based on faiths that came before them. Um, and yes, you're, the, the uh, bit about like the flying discs or whatever, that thing you were talking about does sound hokey, but is that any more silly than like a, a virgin birth or the, uh, the guilt tripping on that website being any different from when my church used to uh, post what people contributed on the board, like publicly. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I'd wrap it up, but basically, like, were you saying it because you don't think that most of society could see these parallels between the new and old spirituality, and that that means that if new spirituality um, takes on uh, using psychedelics, that so that will undermine its legitimacy? Like, I just, I was lost. Thank you. Okay, I'm a little lost, too. Um, 
Yeah, m most of what I said is quoting somebody for whom I have just the deepest respect as having the longest term, wisest view of the role of religion and humanity of any human being I've ever met. That's Houston Smith. And notice that he said, at its worst, it can have these qualities. He didn't say that it always does. Um, I can answer also from some of the time that I spent with Brother David Stendelrast. You know, I was nominally raised in a Christian household. Uh, I didn't connect very much with church other than through the choir, which actually was quite sacred for me, just the production of music. But I didn't get the myths until I visited Brother David for a couple of days at his monastery. And something that I came to appreciate by observing it, although I couldn't appreciate it internally, is the intense tear producing in me gift of receiving a long tradition, of saying words that have been said for thousands of years, said by your parents and their parents and their parents. You know, I just don't have access to that. Uh, it wasn't transmitted to me that way. But how can, here's another way I can put it. To take a bit from this and a bit from this and a bit from this, which by the way, I do a good bit of in my own life. I'm aware that I'm cut off from a richness. I'm aware that I'm starting from scratch. Yes, there are syncretisms, and it, they're, they're inevitable, and they lead to good things. But, um, you know, the Dalai Lama has, has said, as people come to hear him speak and, and are studying Buddhism, he basically says, I'm paraphrasing, you know, if you're a Buddhist, it's great. If you're not a Buddhist, stick with what you got. It's just as good if you make the right thing out of it. And I think he's speaking to the same thing, to the incredible richness, the incredible sense of being anchored throughout history when you can count on a long-standing tradition. And, you know, I, I regret that in my life I don't, and I don't think I'm going to build it. So I'm starting from scratch, too. Wouldn't it be legalized help uh, research and such things as that? Um, would legalization help research? What would help research is just um, making the regulations easier to adhere to, of having fewer restrictions on research, more help from government agencies, government funding would be the biggest thing, and all of that can happen without changing the drug laws. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not standing up for the drug laws the way they are. I'm just saying that when I contemplate an assault weapon pointed at me and appearing before a judge and being no, bankrupted by lawyers' fees and going this to prison. Not question. that that's likely to happen, but I, you know, we, can, we can have those fears. I have those fears. Um, it's possible for the pendulum to swing to the other side. And the other side, in my view, is too far and leads to you know, a different house of horrors. The question I'd like to probe a little bit uh, is, given that the experiences that many of us have on these entheogens is a very primary experience of spirituality. Um, and it, it, having had some experience in different religious traditions, I honor and respect the importance and the value of those people who hold those traditions and pass them down. But we've never had a world before in we've which never every, we've never had a world before in which all traditions were available to us. So we're presented with two r radically new things in my experience. One is a world of traditions. I can study the deepest of the Tibetan Buddhist texts or with teachers or Christianity or Judaism or Sufism or what have you. The other is I have access through the psychedelics and theogens of a primary experience. So now I'm aware of, I grew up in the 60s, I know the defaults of the New Age world um, from personal experience. Um, I'm sorry, I keep trying to. Um, and at this point in my life, I'm also acutely aware that what happens when we build com religious communities, like almost any community, is we create theologies. And the theologies become rigid. And so my question is, how do we protect people using this legally? because the, 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 the Constitution and the law is religious freedom, not church freedom. Not which freedom? It's not church freedom, it's religious freedom. And I don't, so do we have to have a church in order to be free under the Constitution, or can we establish a personal religious um, belief or spiritual belief that meets the constitutional test? Thank you. How do we go about that? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. You've asked a very rich question. In the interest of time, I'm going to give you only one of several answers that comes to mind. 
Uh, I think that you're coming with a very understandable premise that established religions with names, established religious groups, uh, come with them by definition doctrine or even dogma, and that that becomes ossified, and it's a real problem. And, you know, I think it is often a real problem. But that's not a necessary component of an organized religious group. The prime example for which I have the greatest respect is the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers. It is non-credal. At no point do you have to say out loud, I believe in X, Y, Z. It's nominally Christian. Probably a lot of Quakers have a Bible, but that's not ensconced in Quakerism, per se. So it is possible to generate religious community, longitudinally stable, multi-generational, that holds some regular form of worship that is non-hierarchical and non-credal. So I see that as one path forward, and I don't see it as a path forward so much to appease government. I see it as a path forward because it looks like a really good one to me. It looks really wholesome. Well, thank you, Bob Jesse. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. It's a privilege to bring people of wisdom here and uh, really appreciate your talk.